Okay, we're back on the air for lecture 28. There's one more lecture uh, Wednesday. So that'll be 29 lectures in queuing theory. We're just, we're just scratching the surface here. So uh, stay tuned. All right, so the way we st where we stand now is um, uh, homework six is the take home final exam. Uh, I want more, if you can, than just what formulas you used in plugging in and giving the answer but some explanation to go with it because remember this is a final exam. This is going to differentiate the A's from the A minuses. So um, uh, do a good job. Explain things. Now the due date is May 5th, which is the end of the semester. But if you can't make it by that time and you want an I, if you have a reasonable excuse, whatever that might be, tell me as soon as possible by email with a schedule as to when you're going to have things done and then I'll fill out a form and you get it back and sign it and uh, go from there. Now if you're uh, taking it at a remote site then uh, you get extra time. So May 17th is, is the actual date at which it'll be due for people who are taking it on feeds uh, remotely. So if for some reason you're a feed student on a remote site and you can't get it by May 17th, then exactly the same thing. Send me an email requesting an incomplete, but don't do it yet because May 17th is quite a while away. So wait till you get close to it. And then if you feel you can't make it, then you can give me a reason and a date at which you'll get everything done. So today I want to talk about uh, vacation models and a little bit about polling models. And I mentioned this last time. That's where we left off last time. So uh, before we start, are there any questions? So I'm looking at exercise 12 on page 222, which is called the MG1Q with server vacation times. So we have, uh, so this is uh, MG1 with vacations. So if you Google, I just, just before class, I googled vacation models in queuing theory and polling models in queuing theory. They're related. And in each case, I got a couple of hundred thousand hits. So uh, I'm not making this up. These, this is a real subject. Now, the basic idea of the polling model, and that's where the vacation model came from, is this. The, uh, you have a, a bunch of uh, queues or stations, and you have a single server and the server visits the stations in, in, in the simplest model in sequence. And so you look at, go to the first station, and you serve all the messages of customers that are waiting there. And then when there is no, no one left waiting there, then you switch to the next station, and you serve all those guys, and so on. So in isolation, each one of these queues is an MG1 queue. But in this uh, polling model, and it's called polling, by the way, because what you do is you poll the station, and you ask the station whether or not there's work to be done. And if there is, then you do it. And if not, then you go on to the next station. And uh, <clears throat> um, in the polling model, you can see that the um, times you spend at each queue are dependent upon each other. In fact, uh, the more time you spend at this queue, let's say, that means the more customers will be accumulating at the other queues. And therefore, the more time it'll take you to go around and get back to your target queue. And when you get back, since it took you a long, if it took you a longer time to get there, that means that there are going to be more customers waiting there, which means it's going to take more time before you start on the next cycle, which means there'll be more customers waiting and so on. So these cycles are positively correlated. Now, um, the way in which this, uh, uh, polling model was originally handled, which was in, a, in two papers by myself and Grace Murray and one by myself. So this was in 1969 and 1970. These were the original models in which uh, uh, it wasn't assumed that the queues were independent of each other. <clears throat> and you can get this, by the way, by going to my uh, uh, website and uh, Several of my papers are there. You can download them. And in particular, the two papers from the Bell System Technical Journal, which are hard to get now because that was a long time ago and that journal doesn't exist anymore. So the, because the Bell System doesn't exist anymore. Um, but it was the official journal of, uh, of uh, 
AT&T, actually at Bell Labs. And uh, so you can download those two papers or view them. And the uh, Vacation Models paper, which I'm going to discuss today, 1985. And that was written with Steve Furman. And as I say, I'll, I'll get into that. But the point now is that the way in which the polling model was uh, analyzed was to say, well, let's take a queue and call this the target queue, and then say that <clears throat> when you're away serving the other queues, that you're on a vacation. And so the, the trick was to consider the MG1 queue in which when the server is, um, has no work to do, it then takes a vacation, and at the end of the vacation it comes back, and if there are messages or jobs waiting, then it serves those, and at the end of that time, it takes another vacation. And when it comes back, if there's nothing waiting, then it goes immediately on another vacation, so it keeps on cycling around. And uh, the trick was to uh, consider the model with vacations without regard to what the server does on the vacation, and then to hook the um, model in which there's a um, generic vacation to the particular description of the vacations that's generated by the polling model. So that was the trick, and it looks it was complicated. And uh, an interesting thing was that it turns out that I think that the vacation model, which is actually just invented originally as a piece in order to solve this problem, uh, is actually more important than the polling model, which it was designed to, uh, uh, to handle. <coughs> So, uh, I'm going to talk about vacation models, and then maybe I'll get to polling models. I don't think so. Uh, that's a uh, subject in itself. So, with the vacation model, the idea now is that we have a single server, and it's an MG1 queue, except that we have what's called exhaustive service. Now, there's different kinds of assumptions you can make, so I'm going to make the, the, the one that seems to be the most basic which is called exhaustive service. And what that means is that whenever I go on a vacation, or whenever I return from vacation, I serve all the customers who were there and their descendants, and they don't leave and take another vacation until there is no work remaining to be done here. So in that sense, it's exhaustive service because it exhausts all of the waiting customers. Of course, it's, it's interesting that it's sort of recursive in a sense because the length of time you spend here uh, depends on how many customers are here when you arrive. But the more customers that are here when you arrive, the more customers are going to arrive while you're serving them. And so when you finish serving the original customers, then there will be, in general, more customers. And so this builds on itself, in a sense. But actually, it turns out that that's <coughs> fairly simple. Now, another <coughs> um, uh, discipline is called gated service. And the idea of gated service is that when you come back from a vacation, you close a gate behind all the customers that are waiting. And then uh, when you serve all the customers in front of the gate, then you take your next vacation. And you don't serve the customers who are behind the gate until you come back and complete a cycle. So you always close a gate behind the waiting customers every time you return from a vacation. And in fact, there are lots of uh, many variations and uh, for polling models, there's a, um, uh, a reference. Takagi has written a zillion different uh, papers on polling models. He's written a, a gigantic uh, book on queuing theory, which contains some stuff on vacation models. And up until recently, I'd say five years ago, he was regularly putting out um, uh, bibliographies and updating them for all papers having to do with polling models and vacation models as well. So if you're interested in this kind of research, then uh, Takagi is a, is a name to look for. That's a good starting point, because up until roughly five years ago, he had summarized everything that was known about vacation and polling models. So it made it all very, uh, <clears throat> in one place, easy to uh, access. OK, so let's talk about uh, vacation models. Uh, but before that, um, well, let me say that I'm, I'm doing exercise 12. OK, so we're talking about vacation models with exhaustive service. So I'm talking about these guys right here. And this is exercise 12 in the book, which is on page 222. 
And it starts out and describes the MG1 server with uh, Q, with server vacation times. And it says that, um, and this, this is the key to solving these things, is that when you go on vacation, the uh, length of the vacation is described not in terms of the time directly, in terms of the time it takes to make a vacation or take a vacation, but rather in terms of the number of customers uh, who arrive during a vacation. So the key is to uh, uh, represent the vacation length in terms of the generating function of the number of customers who arrive according to a Poisson process during the vacation, and then based on that, go backwards and figure out things like how that is, that is just like with the way we analyzed MG1 by embedding at service completion epochs. We're going to do the same thing here and translate back from uh, description in terms of number of customers, discrete probabilities, to in terms of uh, things like waiting times or transforms of waiting times. So part A says, let pi j star be the equilibrium probability that an arbitrary departing customer leaves behind uh, j others. And um, uh, solve it, write some stuff. So let me start <coughs> by writing down equation 820 for ordinary mg1 without vacations. <coughs> Excuse me. And we've seen, <coughs> we've seen this equation many times now. <coughs> it says that the probability that <coughs> <coughs> the probability that at a service completion epoch, the number of customers left behind <coughs> by a departure is J. It's given by the following. It's the probability that at the previous service completion epoch, the number left behind was 0 times little p0, I'll get back to that in a moment, plus the sum as i runs from 1 to j plus 1 of the probability that at the preceding service completion epoch, the number of customers left behind was i times little p sub j minus i plus 1. OK, now the argument that led to that was that on the right-hand side, <coughs> these represent the uh, probabilities at the service completion epochs of the, uh, of the nth customer, let's say. And then this represents the number left behind at the service completion epoch of the nth plus first customer. And then you take the limit as n go to infinity and claim that at infinity, the number left behind by a departing customer is the same for every customer once an infinite number of customers have run by. And so that gives you these equations which you have to solve. Now, in these equations, uh, this represents the probability now that the previous departure left the system empty. If he left the system empty, that means that the next departure, which is the, guy, the viewpoint we're taking here, must have found the system empty. And if he finds the system empty, then he will leave behind j, and I made a mistake here, there should be a piece of j. He will leave behind j if during the service time of, uh, if during his service time, exactly j new customers arrive according to a Poisson process. Now, this is the probability that the preceding customer left the system in state i where i is greater than 0. So that means that when he left the system, he, it wasn't empty. So immediately upon his leaving, some customer from the queue enters service. And then for him to leave behind j, that means that during his service time, exactly j minus i plus 1 new customers must arrive according to a Poisson process. And we defined the pj. Well, we defined, in fact, the, um, um, the generating function, h of z. And by definition, h of z was the generating function of the little pj's. So this is the generating function of the number of customers that arrive according to a Poisson process during a service time. And of course, it's, it's going to be numerically different for different service time distributions. OK, so then what we did 
was we form the generating function for these probabilities. So g of z by definition that's going to be the summation of pi j star z to the j summed over all j and so that's going to be as j runs from 0 to infinity. So what you do is you take this equation up here you multiply by z to the j, and then you sum. So what you're going to get is this. You get the summation, as j runs from 0 to infinity, of pi 0 star little pj z to the j. That's for this term right here, because I'm multiplying by z to the j and summing. Plus, OK, now the same thing for that term. That's the sum, as j runs from 0 to infinity, of the sum as i runs from 1 to j plus 1, right up here, of uh, pi i star p j minus i plus 1, that guy, z to the j. And then when you sum this out, this thing, of course, you can factor out the pi 0 star. And what's left then, by definition, is the generating function of the little p's. So you have pi 0 star pj, uh, excuse me, pi 0 star times h of z. Plus. And this thing required some work. It was just algebraic manipulation. And what we did is we interchanged the order of summation signs. And then we summed down the columns instead of the rows. Uh, and after some effort, but not much, it turned out that this was identified as g of z, which is the generating function of the pi stars, what we're looking for, minus pi 0 star uh, divided by z times h of z. And this in the textbook is equation 828. So then we could solve this equation for the g, therefore. Therefore, g of z is equal to. And this equal sign here, this is actually equation 830 in the textbook. So we found that this is equal to z minus 1 h of z divided by z minus h of z pi 0 star. And then we had to figure out what the pi 0 star is. One way to do it is to say that pi 0 star is the same thing as pi 0, which is the same thing as p 0, which is the same thing as 1 minus rho. We should, we should know this by heart by now. Uh, the other way to do it more formally is to um, uh, use the normalization requirement, which says that g of 1 is equal to 1. If I plug 1 in here, of course, I get 0 over 0. And so I have to use L'Hopital's rule. I differentiate numerator and denominator separately, set z equal to 1. Everything works out. And the result is that you find out that, as you knew, that pi 0 star is equal to 1 minus rho. So with the putting in equation 832, which is, I think, the normalization equation, then what you get here is um, z minus 1 uh, h of z divided by z minus h of z times 1 minus rho. OK, so the big picture is you embed the, um, uh, uh, the viewpoint at the service completion epochs. This is the embedded Markov chain for the uh, probabilities from the viewpoint of the departing customer. Then you define their generating function, and that in terms of the generating function of the number that arrived during a service time, you get this result. So this is the generating functions you're looking for, and the h of z is the generating function of the number of customers that arrived during a service time. And so different service times are going to give you different h's. And in fact, that's equivalent to, to the Laplace-Gilchrist transform of the distribution function of the length of service. 
So this is the result that I want to store in my mind for the moment. And now I want to come and I want to consider the vacation model and give an analogous argument. OK, so now let me uh, call this equation star. So I'm going to write an equation that's the analog of 820, except that now it's for Q's with vacation. So I'm going to denote the corresponding probabilities by pi hat star j. So this is the equilibrium probability that in the vacation model, a departing customer leaves behind exactly j other customers. So the hat indicates that I'm talking about the vacation model. OK, now, what can happen? Well, now I'm going to argue that uh, the equations that I'm going to write now are going to be very similar to what I did over here, 820, for the Q without vacations. So let's see. First of all, let's look at the analog of the second term. So suppose that the preceding service completion epoch, at the preceding service completion epoch, the number left behind in this vacation model is exactly i. Now, if that's true, then the next service completion epoch, the departing customer will leave behind j if during that time, exactly that service time, exactly j minus i plus 1 customers arrive. And that's going to be summed as before as i runs from 1 to j plus 1. So notice that this term is exactly the same as this term, except it's got a little hat over the pies. OK, so what about the other term? Suppose that at the preceding uh, service completion epoch, um, the, um, uh, the customer left the system empty. If he left the system empty, then what happens is that now the server goes on a vacation. And the server goes on a vacation. And when he returns, he finds a certain number of customers waiting. And uh, uh, that, of course, depends on how long the vacation is. But what we're going to do is we're going to define the vacation in terms of this, uh, in terms of this generating function. So that generating function is called capital P. Or the probabilities are called capital P. So I'm defining f of z is equal to the sum uh, as, uh, let's see, the sum of uh, P of j, that's capital P of j, z to the j. So just as before, we had the generating function of the number of customers that arrive during a service time. Now I'm defining this new generating function in addition to the other one as the generating function of the number of customers that arrive during a vacation. So I'm going to define the vacation length by how many customers arrive during the vacation, assuming, of course, they arrive according to a Poisson process. So pi 0 star tilde is the probability that the preceding service completion epoch, the system was empty and the server went on vacation. Now, when it goes on vacation, when it returns, if it finds customers waiting, then it stops and it serves those customers and all their descendants. And when it, it's done with that, then it goes on another vacation. If it arrives back at the, uh, after the vacation and it finds nobody present, then it takes another vacation. So the probability that it will find exactly i customers waiting, by definition, is pi. I'm going to give myself more room here. OK, so this is pi hat star sub j equals. Okay. Now, pi is the probability that when you return from a vacation, you find i other customers waiting. But you're not going to stop unless i is at least 1. 
because if you find the system empty, then you're going to go and take another vacation. So, you, so if I take that p sub i and divide that by 1 minus p0, this gives me the probability that when I return from a vacation uh, and start serving, that the number of customers waiting at that time is exactly i. In other words, I'm conditioning on the fact that i is not 0. Because if it's 0, I don't stop. I go on another vacation. So this is a tricky, tricky point that you've got to get. But if you don't get it, of course, things aren't going to work out. Then I multiply that by little p j minus i plus 1. And I sum that after multiplying by pi hat 0 star. I sum that as i runs from 1 to j plus 1. OK, so let me repeat that argument and make the observation that this term over here is almost exactly the same as this term over here. That's what, what makes this a vacation model rather than ordinary mg1. So this term, the reasoning behind this is exactly the same as we had before. OK, now over here we say, Suppose that when the uh, uh, server returns from a vacation, suppose that when the server leaves on vacation, suppose that the previous service completion epoch was left the server idle so that he goes on vacation. The probability of that is pi hat 0 star. Now, if that happened, then the server is going to go on vacation, maybe multiple vacations, but eventually it will return. And when it returns, it's going to find and starts to work, it's going to find some number of customers present. If p of i is the probability that during a vacation exactly j customers arrive, or i customers arrive, then p i over 1 minus p 0 is the conditional probability that when the server returns from a vacation, the number of customers it finds is i, given that it's not 0. Because if it was 0, it wouldn't have stopped. It would have continued on and done another vacation. Now, if it stops and starts serving, then the next service completion epoch will leave behind j if during the service time that is going to ensue, exactly j minus i plus 1 new customers arrive, just as over here. So now we have almost the same equations as 820, uh, noting that this one here is almost the same as that. And so all the arithmetic we did for this one is the same as the arithmetic for this one. OK, so let me write out what that says. OK, so now I'm going to get g hat of z. So g hat, this is the generating function of these guys as opposed to the g without the hat, which is the generating function when there are no vacations. So by definition, this is equal to the sum as j runs from 0 to infinity of pi hat star sub j z to the j. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this equation up here, the star equation, through by z to the j and sum just like I did before. So over here, I'm going to take this 1 minus p0, it's a constant, and factor it out. So what I have left is pi 0 hat star divided by 1 minus p0 times the sum as j runs from 0 to infinity of the sum this guy right here, as i runs from 1 to j plus 1 of pi, that's that guy right there, um, times little p of j minus i plus 1, that's that guy right there, times z to the j, plus the same thing over here. So this term is going to be plus the uh, sum as j runs from 0 to infinity of the sum 
as i runs from 1 to j plus 1 of pi i hat star times little p j minus i plus 1 z to the j. OK, so don't get bogged down in arithmetic. These are the basic equations. And then I do the same thing for these guys that I did with a case where there is no vacations. I multiply through by z to the j, and I sum. And in the process, I have to define a new generating function, because not only do I have the generating function of the number of customers that arrive during a service time, but I also now have the generating function of the number of customers that arrive during a vacation time. When I multiply through, then uh, this is exactly what I get. Now, if you'll notice, the complicated term before was this. But we had actually figured out exactly what that was, because by our previous result, when we took that exact same sum, what we got was this thing right here. OK, so now when I sum this, I'm going to get essentially the same thing, except that instead of having the generating function of the pi hat stars, I'm going to have the generating function of the p's, which of course is little f. That's just a constant. And so then I take that equation and I sum it. I, I solve it. So when I get done, when I identify this piece and this piece, and remember, this piece now is exactly the same arithmetic as this, because the only difference between this and this is that here I have p and here I have pi star. That little p and that little p is the same. The z to the j is the same. The limits of summation are the same. So everything is the same. So what I'm going to get then is this. I'm going to get pi 0, or I should say pi hat star 0, sub 0, divided by 1 minus p0. That's this term right here. And then when I compute this, this is going to give me f of z. f now is the generating function of the number that arrived during a vacation, minus p0, the probability that during a vacation nobody arrives, divided by z times h of z, plus g tilde, or hat, of z minus pi hat uh, 0 star over z times h of z. So this term comes from here. This term comes from here. You can see that they're exactly the same thing, except that instead of the generating function g hat, this has got the generating function for f, because the pi stars have been replaced by the p. And instead of the pi 0 star, we have the p 0. Everything else is the same. So what looks like a lot of complicated arithmetic actually turns out to be almost exactly what you've done before, as long as you formulate it correctly. OK, so that means I can now solve this for g hat, because there's the g hat there, and that equals this over here. So I solve it, and I get the following result. So this is just now simple algebra. To solve this equation, isolate the g hat. And it turns out, although it is just simple algebra, that you get the following. You get g hat of z is equal to f of z minus 1 divided by 1 minus p0 times h of z over z minus h of z times pi hat 
star sub zero. Okay, so I solved this equation algebraically to isolate the g hat. There it is, there's that answer. Okay, so what do I have? I've got the generating function for the number left behind in the vacation model in terms of the generating function for the number that arrived during a vacation, which I can either specify myself or find as part of a larger problem. The probability that during a vacation no customers arrive, the generating function of the number that arrived during a service time, and the probability that at a departure epoch in the vacation model, the number left behind is zero. Okay, so as before, I have to figure out what this is. That's the normalizing constant. So I do it the same way as before, which is I set g hat of 1 to 1. That says that these probabilities, the pi hat stars, must sum to 1. So when I do that, if I plug in here z equals 1, then what happens is that this numerator is 0 because f of 1 is 1. It's a generating function. And this denominator is 0 because h of 1 is 1. And so the result is that you have indeterminacy. And so you have to do the same stuff as before. You have to apply L'Hopital's rule. So when you do that, this is just, again, an exercise in freshman calculus, what you find is that the pi hat star 0, this guy right here, is equal to 1 minus p of 0 divided by f prime of 1 times 1 minus rho. OK, so now you know what the pi 0 hat star is. You put it in here, and you now know exactly what the generating function is. Now, the reason that you get a derivative here is because when you use L'Hopital's rule, you have to gener uh, differentiate numerator and denominator separately, and then plug in z equals 1. So that's where this derivative comes from. And notice that the first derivative evaluated at 1 of a generating function is the mean of that distribution. So this denominator here is the expected value of the number of customers that arrive during a vacation. Okay. Of course, the trick here is you don't really know how long a vacation lasts. If it's all defined in terms of the distribution of the number of customers, the p's that arrive during a vacation. Okay, putting that together, I can now write this as follows. g hat of z equals, so I'm just plugging in now for the pi 0 star, hat pi hat 0 star, and uh, doing a little bit of algebraic manipulation so I get it in the following form. I have here f of z minus 1 divided by f prime of 1 times z minus 1 times z minus 1 times h of z divided by z minus h of z times 1 minus rho. And this is uh, the second equation on page 223 in the exercise. OK, so you might say, OK, so what? Just a lot of work here. But if you look at this piece here, you recognize that, in fact, this is the generating function of the distribution of the number of customers left behind by a departure at a service completion epoch in the case in which there are no vacations. So in fact, this is given by equation 832. That's 832. And it turns out, although well, I haven't shown it yet, that this is also a generating function. And in fact, I'm going to write it this way, f v tilde of z. OK, so what we have here, or what it'll turn out, is that the generating function of the number of customers left behind by a departure at a service completion epoch in the vacation model is the product of two generating functions. 
One of them is just what you would see if there were no vacations, and the other one is something else. It'll turn out that this something else is the generating function of the number of customers that arrive according to a Poisson process during an interval whose distribution function is that of the forward recurrence time of uh, a, um, a vacation, an interrupted vacation. Okay, so if you take my word for that at the moment, what that means is that the number of customers left behind by an arbitrary customer is the product of two generating functions. And we know that, uh, that two random variables, independent random variables, uh, discrete integer valued random variables, the generating function of the sum is the product of the generating functions. That tells me that the number of customers left behind by a departure in the vacation model has the same distribution as, doesn't mean it is the same sum, but has the same distribution as if it were the following sum. The sum of the number left behind in the case in which there are no vacations plus something else which has to do only with the vacations. So the um, uh, vacation model decomposes into two parts one of which has to do only with the model in which there are no vacations and the other having to do only with the vacations. The service times are not in here and the vacations are not in here. So you get this so-called uh, stochastic decomposition. So this is a stochastic decomposition. And this is now a very famous result and it has various uh, versions to it. And I haven't finished yet because I haven't really said much about this. I'm going to get to that, or at least in the mean value version. But maybe a little bit of uh, history is worthwhile here because I happen to know it because this is my, partially my stuff. Uh, what's written here is the same as what was done in the 1970 paper, except that in that paper, this part was not correctly identified. It wasn't misidentified. It simply wasn't identified. It simply gave this result along with some others because I'm going to go to the waiting times in a moment. But it gave this result as a product of generating functions. So it had the stochastic decomposition, but it didn't identify this as being the, de the, the uh, generating function of a forward recurrence time of a vacation. So that was an important oversight. Of course, this was done in 1970. And uh, at that time, I really didn't know very much. In fact, this whole thing about uh, forward recurrence times was not all that well known. It's, it, now everybody understands it. But in 1970, uh, not as many people understood what was going on. Later, this was um, uh, recognized as being the generating function of a forward recurrence time. And that was done in 1975 in a paper by Levy and Yekiali. And then in 1985, a uh, paper was published by uh, Furman, Steve Furman and myself, uh, in which uh, this whole thing was generalized. And we found out that this deco stochastic decomposition holds not only for exhaustive service, but in fact for lots of different service time dis uh, uh, distributions. So this was like a major step up, and it removed it from something that was relatively obscure to something that was very general. And so what's a little bit interesting about that is how that came about. Because remember that the vacation model was um, um, defined. It was, it was based on, it, it was generated because of, um, motivated by its application in a polling model. Now, I left uh, Bell Labs in 1968. And a few years later, probably early 70s, uh, Steve Furman, so this is S. W. Furman, F. U. H. R. M. A. N. N. Steve Furman came to work for Bell Labs at Bell Labs, and he worked in the department that I had left. And one of his assignments was to take the work that uh, I and Grace Murray had done on polling models, and uh, try and push that further and see what how it could be applied. And so Furman. Uh, in investigating that, of course, returned to the vacation model, and he came up with the generalization of this stochastic decomposition. 
And the way I got in touch with it was that it turns out that right around that time, early 80s, um, uh, Marty Solomon, Professor Solomon, joined our faculty. And it turned out that he and Furman were friends. And so he said to Furman, or Furman said to him, I don't know who said which, what are you doing? And one thing led to another, and Furman told Marty that he was working on the stuff that uh, I had worked on when I was at Bell Labs. And so Marty told me, and one thing led to another, and we got together. And Furman had come up with this uh, uh, really beautiful generalization of the result that I had done in 1970. And so we published it together in a paper in 1985 called something like uh, MG1Qs with generalized vacations or something like that. And that's the 1985 paper. And uh, so it's by Furman and Cooper. His name comes first because, although it was based on my work, it was his generalization. And uh, uh, that then became a very well-known paper. Because for one thing, it, this whole subject had been dormant. I think, don't think anybody even recognized that it had any interest or much application at first. This was in, uh, when it was first published in 70. But by 85, this was 15 years later, now all of a sudden there were uh, other applications, a lot more interest. And so when we got this so-called stochastic decomposition, this was a big deal. And so this was very fortunate for me and uh, uh, maybe for Furman too, because this joint paper, as I say, is widely, um, uh, widely quoted. And if you go and you Google polling models, vacation models, stochastic decomposition, things like that, as I say, you'll find hundreds of thousands of hits. And so uh, uh, I always like to say that, uh, that the fact that I was introduced to Furman turned out to be very, very lucky for me and uh, maybe was somewhat beneficial to the world. And to that extent, this was Marty Solomon's only positive contribution to mankind. So, uh, uh, so remember, when you see him next, that this was, the, this was what he did. He introduced Furman to me and made my life a lot better. OK, so let's go on with this. Uh, where I am now is um, this is the second equation. Actually, the first equation doesn't have a number in it. Uh, it's in part A on page 223. OK, so page 223 in this exercise. So remember, this is the neatest case, and it works for um, um, exhaustive service. And what was done when the paper with Furman was basically a generalization in two directions. One was that uh, a better interpretation was, give, was given of what this piece was. And the second and more important one, because that had already been done, the second thing was to um, uh, recognize that uh, similar decomposition, stochastic decomposition, occurred for other vacation disciplines, including, for example, uh, gated discipline. So lots of papers have been written since that time in which the stochastic decomposition is uh, discovered for, uh, for different, um, different uh, vacation disciplines. OK, any questions about that? So you see the, bi the big picture here. So there's a lot of algebra, and things get obscured in the algebra. But actually, if you, if you look through it, the algebra isn't that bad, because the complicating term right here is exactly the same as what was the term in the case where there were no vacations. And in fact, that's why it all works out. That's why things factor, and why you have this stochastic decomposition. So, Let's go back to this. What this says, what is very, very surprising is, it turns out to say the following. When you translate this from generating function of the number of customers left behind to the length of, to the waiting times, just like in ordinary MG1, it turns out that the, um, uh, that the Laplace Diltz transform of the waiting times in the vacation model is a product of two transforms one of which is exactly what you get in the ordinary MG1Q, in other words, the Polachek-Kinchin transform, and the other of which 
is the Laplace filters transform of the distribution function of a forward recurrence time of a vacation. So that means that the length of time that somebody waits in a vacation model has the same distribution as a sum of two independent random variables, one of which is the forward recurrence time or the remainder of an interrupted vacation and the other of which is exactly what you would see if there were no vacations. Now what's amazing about that is that if you look at an individual customer, the individual customer's waiting time is not the sum of what happens in a vacation plus what happens if there were no vacations, but it's some kind of uh, confluence of those things. It's all mixed together. Nevertheless, in terms of distribution, it's just as if the waiting time were some of these two independent pieces. So that's very, very remarkable because there's no straightforward physical interpretation. In other words, suppose I was looking at, for example, suppose I wanted to find, uh, study the response time or the sojourn time in an ordinary MG1Q. Well, how long does a customer wait? What's his sojourn time in an ordinary MG1? First, it's the length of time he waits. Then you add to that the length of time he spends in service. So the sum of those two times is the total time that he spends from arrival to departure. That's his sojourn time. So that means that the distribution of sojourn times is obtained by taking the convolution of the time spent waiting and the time uh, spent in service. So in that case, that convolution means that the actual sojourn time of a customer is actually equal to the sum of these two independent random variables. In this case, the waiting time is not actually equal to the sum of two independent random variables, but it has the same distribution as the sum of two independent random variables. So when a customer arrives, if he arrives during a vacation, he doesn't necessarily wait just the vacation, he waits until the vacation ends, plus he waits the time when the server is busy. But that time reflects the vacation because among those waiting customers are the other customers that arrive during the vacation. So those things are, uh, are uh, mixed together. They're not separated, but in distribution, they're just as if they were separated. So this is, this is got to think about this a while, but that's what one of the interesting facts about this. Okay, so let's go back and look at this from an expected value viewpoint, because then it's easiest to understand, even though it's not as general as you might like. And by the way, nowhere in this um, derivation is it required that the vacations be independent of each other. And in fact, if that were required, then the original reason for doing this would be invalid because, as I argued, the successive uh, cycles in the, queuing in the uh, cyclic queuing model are clearly not independent. They're positively correlated because long cycles tend to be followed by long cycles. Short cycles tend to be followed by short cycles. So uh, it turns out that a common error in the literature for people who are looking only at vacation models is they start in their analysis and they say something like, uh, assume that the service times are independent of the arrival process, blah, 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 and that the vacations are mutually independent. Well, the results are true if the vacations are mutually independent, but it does not require that they be mutually independent. The same results are true even if vacations are not independent. So that, and as I say, if that were not true, then most of the applications of this would not be valid. They would be approximations. Okay, so let's go back to MG1 for a minute. So this is MG1 without vacations. And uh, we have this uh, formula. This is the Polachek kinchin mean value formula. The expected value of the waiting time is equal to rho over 1 minus rho, E of x over 2, 1 plus, now, here is the ratio of the variance to the square of the mean of the service times. But I'm not going to write V of x for variance because I don't want to get confused with vacation. So I'm going to write the variance as sigma squared sub x. 
That's the variant of the service time distribution function. This is the square of the average. And this is equation 839, which we've seen a zillion times. So it's the famous polycheck kinchin mean value formula. on page 217. Now, we argued earlier that this is the same thing as the forward recurrence time, forward recurrence time of a service time. And we saw this this was illustrated in homework two. In other words, if I had a, um, uh, a sequence of service times, and I interrupt one of them at random, and I ask for the average value of the remainder, the time from interruption till the end of the service time, then the expected value of that distance, the remainder, or the forward recurrence time is given by this formula right here. And this introduced uh, some strange results because what it shows is that the only time that this is actually equal to half a service time, which is what you would expect if you didn't understand anything about probability, is in the case when the variance of the service times is zero. In other words, when there's no randomness. So all of the uh, uh, effects of randomness in queuing theory, well, what makes queuing theory is the randomness. Otherwise, everything would just be lockstep. There would be nothing to it. Now, what uh, you're asked to prove in this uh, vacation model is the following. The expected value of the waiting time, that's the hat, in the vacation model is well, remember over here I said that the number left behind is the sum of two numbers, one being the number you would leave behind if there were no vacations, and the other being the number that arrived during a uh, forward recurrence time of a vacation. So the expected value of the waiting time is equal to the sum of two pieces. One is the expected value of the waiting time if there were no uh, vacations, and the other is the second derivative of the generating function of the number that arrived during a vacation divided by 2 lambda f prime of 1. And this is statement g on page 223. OK, so let's go back to the statement of the problem now. So here's what the problem it asks you to, to, to um, uh, derive that. OK, now first of all, there's uh, this result right here, which says that g is given by that times that. Now if you remember um, um, from that, let me go one step further. From that I could show right here, let me erase it and go over here. OK, so where we stand today is we have proved that formula right there. Now, from this, I could differentiate and set z equal to 1. So I could get g hat prime of 1 is equal to g prime of 1 uh, plus f double prime of 1 divided by 2 f prime of 1. OK, so in part d of the homework problem, of the exercise, it asks you to show that this is true. How do you get that? Well, you get that from here by simply differentiating and setting z equal to 1. Now, when I differentiate, that actually isn't as bad as it looks because I'm going to differentiate a product. So when I differentiate the product, I'm going to get the derivative of this times that plus the derivative of that times that. And when I plug in the 1, that means that this part, 
we already know. Because we've done that, that's going to give me the average number in the system without vacations. So in fact, when I differentiate this and apply L'Hopital's rule, I'm going to get a sum of two pieces. One piece comes directly from here. So we've already done that. And the other piece comes directly from there. OK, so now let's look at these pieces. This says that the average number left behind by a departure in the vacation model is equal to the average number left behind in the model with no vacations plus something else to something else having to do only with the vacations. Again, this is this, uh, this decomposition. Now, if I take g prime of 1, which is the average number left behind, and subtract rho, then I would have the average number left in the queue, because rho is the average number in service. The average number left in the queue uh, by a departure is the same as the average number found by a departure, by, pasta, by the one-step theorem. And that's equal to the average uh, number in the queue uh, by, um, uh, by pasta. OK, so I'm going to subtract rho there, and I'll subtract the same rho here. And this other piece remains the same, plus f double prime of 1 to f prime of 1. Now, if I divide through by lambda, there's a lambda, there's lambda, there's lambda. This thing, as we already saw, by Little's theorem, that corresponds to E of w, the expected number in the queue, excuse me, the expected time spent in the queue in the MG1 queue without vacations. So this thing. If I take the average number left behind, subtract the number in service, divide by lambda by Little's theorem, that thing is the average number or the average time spent in the queue with vacations. So this tells me that the average waiting time in the model with vacations is equal to the average waiting time in the model without vacations plus this piece, that piece being exactly this piece right here. And this is given in part g of the exercise. Now, by the way, all of this arithmetic is worked out in detail in the solutions manual. So if you want to follow it through, you can see it. But I'm just trying to get to the main points here. So what we did with, was we wrote these equations for the embedded Markov chain. We solved them, and we found that the generating function we're looking for is this product. And we recognize this one as what we had if there were no vacations. And then in order to get the expected value, we differentiate and set the argument equal to 1. And by some minor arithmetic, we get this result right over here, which translates immediately by Little's theorem to this result right over here. So this tells me that the average waiting time in the, um, uh, in the queue with vacations is equal to the average waiting time in the queue where there are no vacations, plus something that has only to do with the vacations. OK, now let me look at this term right here and connect that to a forward recurrence time. Then I'm going to plug in some numbers, and you'll see some surprising things. f of z is the generating function of the number of customers that arrive during a vacation. That's its definition. And we know that there's a relationship between the generating function of the number of customers that arrive according to a Poisson process during a random interval and the length distribution function of the length of that random interval. That is, the generating function is related to the laplace tilts transform. So if I call capital phi, or phi, the laplace tilts transform of the distribution function of a vacation, 
So I'll put a V on here to indicate it's a transform of a vacation. And I evaluate that at lambda minus lambda z. So we've already seen this several times. So the generating function of the number that arrived during a vacation is related to the laplace tilde transform of the length of the vacation by replacing z by lambda minus lambda z. And we've used this several times. We proved this in class. So that means that the derivative, f prime of z, is equal to, if I differentiate this using the chain rule, I just take this minus lambda outside. So I get minus lambda times phi prime of v evaluated at lambda minus lambda z. So therefore, f prime of 1, remember what I'm trying to do is I'm going to substitute back into here. f prime of 1 is equal to minus lambda times phi prime at 0. Because when I plug in uh, 1 for z, I get lambda minus lambda, which is 0. But minus the, uh, this, the um, if I take the laplace tilde transform, take its first derivative, multiply by minus 1, set the argument equal to 0, I get the expected value. So this is equal to lambda times the expected value of a vacation. All right, we've already seen that before, too, the idea that when I differentiate the transforms, I get the, I get the moments. How about the second derivative? f double prime of z. From here, I just differentiate that. So all that happens is I multiply this by minus lambda. So I'm left with lambda squared phi double prime sub v of lambda minus lambda z. And now I'm going to set z equal to 1 there. So I get f double prime of 1 is equal to lambda squared phi double prime sub v of 0. And remember that the second derivative evaluated at 0 is the second moment. So this gives me lambda squared times the expected value of the square of a vacation. So therefore, I could see that if I calculate f double prime of 1, this guy over here, divided by 2 lambda times f double prime times f prime of 1. I'm just calculating that here. So there's my f double prime. There's my f prime. I just take that ratio, and I find out that that is equal to lambda squared times the second moment. That's that guy right there, divided by uh, 2 lambda squared times the first moment. I cancel out the lambda squares. And what I get is the second moment of the vacation length divided by 2 times the average vacation length. Or in other words, using the fact that there's a relationship between the second moment and the variance, this is the same thing as the expected value of the variance excuse me, expected value of the vacation length divided by 2 times 1 plus the variance of the vacation length divided by the square of the average vacation. OK, so to go from here to here, all I did was use the fact that the variance is equal to the second moment minus the mean square. OK, so now that means that I can go back to here. And I could say that, the, um, that the, that's the average waiting time in the queue with no vacations. And this piece over here is exactly the same as this, which is the average value of vacation divided by 2 times 1 plus the variance of the vacation lengths divided by the square of the average vacation length. But notice that this is the same as that. So what I get is the expected value of the waiting time in the case with vacations 
is equal to this thing right here, which is equal to rho over 1 minus rho times e of x over 2 times 1 plus the variance of the service times divided by the square of the average service time plus the average value of the vacation length over 2 times 1 plus the variance of the vacation lengths divided by the square of the average vacation length. OK, so there's two ways to look at this. One is to simply say right here, the average waiting time in the vacation model is exactly the same as in the corresponding model with no vacations plus this term, which depends only on the mean and the variance of the vacation lengths. But if I recognize that this average waiting time without vacations is given by this, and I know that this piece is a forward recurrence time of service times, therefore, this piece represents the forward recurrence time of the vacations. Because these two are of exactly the same form. The only difference is that this is computed for service times, this is computed for vacation times. So now we have something that's pretty neat to interpret. Even though the vacation model looks like it's very complicated and the vacations and the service times all uh, um, fold up and contribute to each other or interact, when you actually solve the problem, it turns out that everything decomposes and separates, and it separates into terms that are themselves um, interpretable. So it says that the average waiting time in the model with vacations is exactly what you would get if there were no vacations, and in the model plus something else. And that something else is exactly a forward recurrence time of a vacation, just as in the model over here, without vacations, this piece is the forward recurrence time of a service time. So the vacations and the service time separate out, they decompose, and this forward recurrence time turns out to be an important point. Now, remember that the forward recurrence times are things that are kind of bizarre. So in fact, what I'm going to do next time is uh, I'm going to go through an example in which I'm going to pick some values and I'm going to compute this. And then what you'll see is that we'll have the anomaly because of homework two. That in the vacation model, I can take the vacations and I can stretch the vacations out, which forces the server to be away longer. So when the server gets done with the vacation, he goes and takes a smoke. And then he comes back and does his work. And when he does that, waiting time overall actually decreases. So this is an amazing result. And it turns out to be true because of, the, of this decomposition. And because that in the decomposition, the vacation part turns out to have the form of the forward recurrence time. So in fact, when you look at polling models, which are much more complicated and you can't get explicit solutions, it turns out that the same effect is sometimes in there, namely that by decreasing by making the server work faster when it's doing its work away from the target queue, it actually increases the waiting times. And that you can actually decrease the waiting times by forcing the server to slow down. So this is very strange. So we'll go into this, I'll put numbers in it next time, starting with these formulas. So next time, uh, take a look at your homework two, because that's why I put in homework two. Homework two fits right in with this because homework two asks you to calculate the uh, uh, remainder of an interval that you interrupt at random and shows that in some cases, as that interval gets longer, the interrupted part actually gets smaller. In fact, the whole thing gets smaller. OK, so my advice then for next time is take a look at exercise number 12. Um, Google this stuff. Look at the 1985 paper, get some ideas to what's going on, and then I'm going to next time work out this example and then look at the actual distribution of waiting times instead of just the average waiting times, show that you get the same um, 
decomposition and that um, you can view the waiting time of an individual customer as having the same distribution as if it were composed of, but it isn't, a sum of two independent pieces, one of which is what the waiting time would be if there were no vacations, and the other is uh, a forward recurrence time of a vacation. OK, any questions or everybody with it? OK, so check this out for next week. Just keep your eye on the big picture. Not next week.